Welcome to the behavioral sciences section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, I'm going to be going through questions 61 to 65. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 61, 62, 63, 64, and 65. Now, let's go through the questions together. In question 61, it says a study found that the just noticeable difference for participants looking at various candles was going from a candle of one lumen to two lumens. Using Weber's law, it can be inferred that patients could determine the difference between a candle of 50 lumens and blank. So we're talking about the just noticeable difference, we're talking about Weber's law, and the difference here was one lumen to two lumens. Okay. So Weber's law is saying that if we are looking at the noticeable difference between two, two different instances or two scenarios for a given unit, then it's going to be a constant ratio. So if we go from one lumen to two lumen, and that's when we notice the difference, but not in between one and two, then that's the same ratio that's going to happen when we start at 50 lumens and then change to another number of lumens. So in this case, it was a doubling is what we initially noticed. So if we have 50 lumens, it's going to be once again a doubling or a one to two ratio, which we're going to detect. So it's not when we get to 51 or 55 lumens that we're gonna detect a difference. It's when we get to at least 100. And then beyond that, also we can detect differences. So A is incorrect. You can detect difference between 50 and 50 lumens. 51 lumens in option B is also not high enough. C is correct. D, of course, you would see a difference again between 50 and 200, but we're talking about what's the just noticeable difference that we just need to reach before we detect a difference. 100 is sufficient. In question 62, it says a physician recommends a blood transfusion to a patient. However, the patient declines this intervention based on religious grounds. The physician is understanding and works to provide optimal non-transfusion based care. This serves as an example of blank. So a physician is recommending blood transfusion, but the patient declines based on religious grounds. So what's going on here is there are cultural differences between wherever this physician is and where this is taking place and where the, this person, the patient comes from. Or they could be you know, in the same place, but there are still cultural differences between them. And the key thing here is that the physician is understanding. So there are cultural differences, and I'm looking, what is this an example of? There are cultural differences, and the physician could either say, you know, that's crazy, I'm just looking at this from my point of view, from the culture that I come from, and here it would just be nonsensical to refuse a blood transfusion, but that would fall under option A, which is ethnocentrism, which is not what's going on here, so we remove option A. When you just focus on things from your own biased cultural point of view and judge other cultures. But in this case, the physician is more understanding and more empathetic and understands that this is something that is important to this patient from the culture that they come from. And it's not fair of me, of me to judge based on my standards. So I'll accommodate that and I'll give them the treatment which they desire. That is called cultural relativism. So D is the correct answer. It's not multiculturalism. Sure, we have different cultures living together, but that doesn't really explain what's going on in this scenario. And assimilation is when an individual from a different culture comes to a new place and then begins to adopt the norms and values of the new culture and is assimilated then into that new culture. But that's not what's happening here because this individual is still carrying the values from their original culture. So they did not assimilate on that sense. So that's not what's going on here and D is the correct answer. In question 63, it says a drug that increases the levels of dopamine in the brain could be expected to have which of the following long-term effects. So there is a drug and it's increasing dopamine in the brain. What long-term effect could there be? That's what we're looking for. Option A is saying increasing the irritability of the patient. Sometimes, yes, like if someone gets too addicted to something which is increasing dopamine, they can have irritability, but that is often coming from them not getting the drug and it's withdrawal symptoms. So there isn't really a clear link between dopamine and irritability, especially if you're getting 
the constant supply of irritability. So you're getting the, the drug for a long time, so that's not going to lead to irritability, and we're doing it based on like a treatment. So that's not a good answer, A. Option B is saying preventing the excitability of the patient. Once again, there's not like a really good link between excitability of someone and a drug, and also patients on a drug, their excitability can fluctuate. So it's not that either. Option C, seeing disruption of pH balance by the kidneys. No, there's not a clear link between dopamine and the kidneys. Doesn't really play a part in that. It's more so involved in things going on in the brain. And finally, D is correct. We have a drug increasing levels of dopamine. It's possible that you could develop an addiction to the drug because it's part of the brain's reward pathway, dopamine. So you take the drug and it gives you this nice feeling. And because you have that feeling, you want to take that drug even more and continue having that feeling. Over time, your actual physiological characteristics in the brain change so that you need more of a hit to reach that same level of, a, of pleasure that you get from the drug. Because of all of these things, you develop an addiction to drugs. And this is one of the mechanisms that a lot of drugs use, which is that they increase the level of dro dopamine in the brain or other of the other neurotransmitters in the brain's reward pathway. So this is a logical long-term effect that we can expect. In question 64, we're asked which of the following reinforcement schedules is used in a classroom where students are provided grades for each assessment that is submitted. So students are provided with a grade for each assignment that's submitted. Which reinforcement schedule is that? So you can have either fixed or variable things, and it can be a ratio or an interval. So if it's fixed, it's happening at the same number again and again. If it's variable, then it changes. And a ratio means this amount of things happen, and interval means this amount of time passes before this thing happens again. And in this case, if you are saying for a certain number of assignments, you are going to get a grade, not that it's varying based on this time or anything like that, then it's a ratio, it's not the interval once and it's not variable it's not like after a few assignments i'm not exactly sure when but you students are going to get a grade back that's not what's going on here it's a fixed ratio after a certain number of assignments that you submit you're going to get a grade back and in this case it's every assignment so that number is one that's what the ratio is but it's a fixed ratio type of reinforcement schedule in question 65 it says per cognitive appraisal theory secondary appraisal is what so in the cognitive appraisal theory, there's secondary appraisal. So in this theory, primary appraisal is like this theory, first of all, looks at all stressors as the same instead of, it says that all stressors are dealt with in the same manner instead of in different manners. And primary appraisal is when you first evaluate the situation and look and see if there are any stressors and then identify them. Secondary appraisal is when you determine if this, the individual can cope with that stressor or not. And then if you can, then you try to deal with the stressor. If not, there's going to be a larger generation of more stress, and that's going to keep going, and it leads to you know, re resistance and all these other things, these negative effects that stress has on the body. So secondary appraisal, once again, is evaluating if an individual can actually cope with the stress, and that would be option D. Option A is saying evaluates the situation for the presence of stressors. No, that's primary appraisal. Option B is saying evaluates a secondary stressor rather than a primary stressor. No, stressors are looked at and evaluated in the same manner. And finally, like there aren't primary or secondary stressors. And finally, option C is saying it's typically not utilized in fairly stressful circumstances. No, like I said, in any circumstance where you're seeing some stressor, you can go through these stages. And so, yeah, it's not just happening in you know, non-stressful circumstances. It happens in all circumstances where some stress is occurring. So D is the correct answer. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description. And if you enjoyed what you saw here, the course goes through a lot more questions just like this, explaining all the different answer options so that you have the right type of thinking for the MCAT. Here are some reviews for the course. And that's it for this video. Make sure to subscribe here if you enjoyed what you saw. And I will see you guys in the next video.